Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another Flycast Partners presentation. I want to welcome all of you from all over. Today, we have a packed house, so bear with us as we're helping folks get in. Uh, we have folks from Toronto. We have folks from uh, the British Columbia. We've got people from Alaska, Hawaii, and Texas, and Florida, and California, and everything in between. So I want to welcome all of you and all the time zones that we're covering today. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Today's presentation really focuses on what government patching that will save you from legacy or cumbersome solutions. It's a virtual lunch and learn. Now, this can apply to not just government agencies. It can apply to local, federal, can apply to schools, whoever that might be, but also to your organization, whether that be a non-for-profit, it could be uh, you know, just a regular corporation, whatever that might be, these these solutions will save you so much time and effort for your organization, allowing you to focus on normal things that you need to focus on in AT, uh, in uh, IT on a normal day-to-day -day basis. Our presenter today, a lot of you already know him, Kyle Hamilton. Now, Kyle has been around for well over 20 years in the IT space, and he has demonstrated a working history information technology services industry is very strong, skilled in business service management, sales, network automation, ITIL processes, ITIL service management, ITIL asset management, uh, IT asset management. Uh, he has uh, been involved with multiple different types of uh, IT software vendors out there. He understands multiple types of tools and can make a business case on what would be a better solution for your organization. He has a lot of expertise there. So we're very happy to have Kyle presenting for us today. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce Flycast Partners. Flycast Partners offers best in class implementation services and training in IT service management. IT asset management, IT operations management, enterprise service management, and workload automation spaces utilizing ITIL best practice. Our professional services team has well over 5,500 professional services engagements, both on-site and remote. Yes, remote. COVID has taught us the value of remote, hence the reason for this webinar today. This particular tool or these sets of tools can help you with those remote situations. And as an organization, Flycast partners as well over 1,100 regular customers throughout Canada and the United States. And I encourage you to reach out to us at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2270. Or you can visit us on our website. Yeah, there's that green chat box down there. Yeah, those guys are standing by for you Monday through Friday during normal business hours. They're happy to answer questions for you. Gather any information you may be searching for or help you get the training that you may need or your organization may need. Uh, if you don't want to do that, we encourage you to as well email us at info at flycastpartners.com. Feel free to utilize our website to download white, uh, white papers and data sheets and any other material you think may be helpful for you and your organization. Uh, during this presentation, it is a live presentation, folks, so we will be taking your questions live. I encourage you to type your questions in the question section of this go-to webinar. Throughout this presentation, we will get the answers directly from the source himself, Kyle Hamilton. So without further delay, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to the star of the hour, Kyle Hamilton. Kyle, you now have control, sir. All right, well, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Again, my name is Kyle Hamilton. I'm an engineer with Flycast. I'm here to provide you with your overview of uh, Avanti's patching solution, um, giving you some uh, insights into how you can use tools such as Avanti to be able to automate patching and make it, make it a much less time and resource intensive process um, than it is for many customers and, and continues to be for a lot of organizations. Now, before we talk about patching specifically, um, know that you know, the capability to be able to patch and, and understand what your patching status or stance looks like all is all determined based on taking and being able to collect a good inventory. Um, so number one, having a solution that can go out and identify what devices you have, number one. Um, but then of course, even more importantly, is being able to identify what you, you know, have on those devices, what kind of software is running on those machines that may need to be patched, of course, what kind of operating system it has. So being able to collect, you know, a good 
solid inventory that lets you know all the information about the operating system, about all of the software that's installed on the devices, um, you know, and their correct versions. That's of course critical and then being able to determine, you know, what patches are available for those applications, what patches are available for that operating system, as well as potentially what patches are available for the device itself. So um, knowing, you know, that it has um, a BIOS, being able to update that Dell or HP or Lenovo BIOS or the NIC card driver or the video drivers, those are also things that, that we'll talk about that can aid uh, in maintaining a device above and beyond operating system patches or even application patches. So it's first, you know, more or less um, requisite you collect a good inventory so that you know exactly what's out there and what it has installed. Now we know it's installed on the individual devices in terms of what kind of patches they have, what kind of applications are installed. Now the next step would be to, of course, know what's actually out there and available. And that's where the Shavik patch engine allows us to create kind of a, a, a clearinghouse for patches from multiple vendors everywhere from uh, seven zip all the way to Yahoo Messenger, as well as being able to maintain those hardware drivers, as I mentioned, for vendors like Dell, HP, and Lenovo. So, in addition to being able to, you know, download content specific to the operating systems you support, which, uh, of course, with uh, endpoint management, you've got agents and the ability to patch Unix, Linux. Windows and Macs, right? Um, so I can go through here and number one, define which of those operating systems I have to manage. And then of course, which you know flavors of those operating systems I have. So I get the right patches. Um, you know, if I have Macs in my environment that I want to patch um, so that I can, you know, create more or less a, a download of all the content that's applicable to my environment all the different operating systems, if I have any of those specific hardware um, vendors. So I've got laptops and desktops. I wanna make sure and grab all those drivers for each of those models so that we can set this up on a schedule. So we're going to this, you know, uh, Shavlet Clearinghouse and we're saying, you know, on such and such date and time or once a week at 2 p.m., I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna, grab all the patches that are available for all the following desktops that we have and all the following operating systems. Now, all that content, you know, almost down here at the bottom, that can be done manually if you want to do that just as needed or as you feel you know, necessary. Or again, you can create that as a scheduled download. So that's something that's ongoing so that you'll always be looking at the latest patches when you come to you know, do your review. Then when those patches get downloaded, all that content ends up in a library of, uh, a library of folders on your endpoint server. And in these folders, that's going to allow you to uh, go through those individual patches and determine how you want to treat each one, whether you want those to you know, immediately go out and start scanning for all of these patches on your devices or are there certain patches that maybe you know you don't want? Of course, you can go in, whether it's a, a Dell patch or whether it's a Microsoft or Firefox patch, right? You can always open that up and look at the detailed patch metadata that gets downloaded so you understand exactly what you're dealing with, with links out to the CVEs if you want to look at the CVE information regarding that, that update or that vulnerability. Um, but by automatically dropping these patches in the scan folder, now I'm automatically scanning all my devices for any of those vulnerabilities or those security fixes. And if they have those, then those will automatically be installed on whatever schedule I've predefined. So whether I want to patch you know, as needed or save everything until Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. or Saturday morning at 1 a.m., I can have that predefined so that I'm setting up a, a, a regular cadence for my download where I go and acquire all the patches from the Shavlik engine so I know what, what's available. 
I'm taking my routine inventory so I know what my machines have. Now I can start you know, using a comparison of those two to determine which devices need which patches. Now, if there happened to be a particular patch that I don't need or I don't want, now, of course, I may go back and filter that out in my download. Maybe in the future, if I'm getting stuff I don't need, maybe I need to go back and deselect a few things. But there may ever be, once in a while be a patch that maybe causes a problem due to some particular scenario in your environment. Um, instead of you know, scanning for that, you may want to take that patch and just simply throw it in the do not scan folder so that that more or less gets taken out of the rotation. You're not going to be looking for it. You're not going to be installing it. You're not going to be identifying, you know, who has it, who doesn't. And you're basically saying, you know, ignore this patch. Um, that way you can, you know, quickly go through and identify all those problematic patches that may get downloaded throw those in that do not scan folder so that you can eliminate you know, any issues that they may cause, give you some time to do some remediation, investigation, figure out what the problem may be, at which time it's just as easy at that point to take that same patch and throw it right back into that scan folder so that now that you know patch is being looked for and the next time it's found missing, you know, we can go ahead and install it as needed. So these Folders that you see in here in this patch and compliance module not only provide a way for you to just logically break down and group patches together, whether it's by vendor or by product or by some other criteria you want to by operating system, um, but also to provide some functionality to those to those folders so that depending upon you know which folder that patch resides in is going to determine ultimately how that patch is processed, deployed, and or treated within your environment. Now you can also take your inventory that you collect, which may encompass you know all types of devices, desktops, laptops, servers, um, mobile devices, um, and then of course a mishmash of vendors from. Lenovo to HP to Dell and on and on. Um, you want to be able to group and and you know, patch those devices maybe in you know particular fashion. So it gives you the ability to create scopes out of that inventory. So you can easily, you know, if you're dealing with just HP devices, you may have a scope. You know, quickly allows you to just identify all your HP machines or your Apple devices. Um, or by type, by laptop, desktop. Um, you may be patching a piece of software, in which case you want to know all the devices running that piece of software. So it makes it easy to use these scopes. So when it comes time to installing a patch, if I'm installing a patch for Windows 10, you know, it makes it very easy for me to quickly get to a list of all my Windows 10 devices that I'm going to need to you know, uh, deploy those patches to. Now, this several ways in which you can you know, deploy those patches. And I mentioned being able to use these, you know, the scan and do not scan folders. But in addition to that, you can also apply specific criteria to the patch so that, for example, if there's a particular patch that's, you know, maybe particularly critical, um, opens up a uh, real nasty security you know vulnerability you may want to patch it immediately you know and not only immediately but patch it anywhere it's found immediately at any time that it's found so that'd be uh, a use for what's called auto fix where you know i can go in and patch by patch basis go in and define this as i want this patch to be auto fixed meaning automatically install it and again, ignore schedules, ignore all the other settings and everything that have been defined. Um, wherever you see this missing, make sure that it's not missing anymore. Or being able to then break that down using those same scopes so that I could perhaps automatically deploy it to my Dell machines while manually dealing with Apple's or virtual systems and things like that. So give you the ability to break down how you treat those patches, whether you want to automatically deploy those immediately, whether you want to leave those um, to the regular patch schedule, um, or whether you want to 
you know, deal with one specific group of machines in a very different way. So I can use those scopes, you know, throughout that process. Now the same thing applies when you when you're looking at your patch inventory and the patch information that you collect. When you initially open up the patch and compliance dashboard here, you'll see down at the bottom that it provides several dashboard components, uh, which you can update or, or, or modify and build so that it can kind of highlight you know, your current patch stance. You know, how many patches you know, by operating system are missing, which devices are missing the most patches, you know, which critical patches you know, are we most susceptible to. Um, so kind of giving you all the different slices of your inventory to allow you to, to get a good idea of what your patch stance looks like. But yeah, at the same time, you can also use those scopes once again, so that if I want to get that dashboard information solely for my HP machines, then I can select that scope, in which case all of my you know, my patch information updates, you know, just for that particular group of devices. So it enables you not only to deploy those patches and, you know, um, scan for those patches using those scopes, but also to easily allow you to build your reports and your dashboard views and be able to leverage those so that, you know, managers or, you know, patch administrators that quickly want to get a feel for, you know, how they look on their Windows 10 devices versus maybe their servers that they're also patching and maybe even more critical how those look. So they can have, you know, their own dedicated dashboards as well as, of course, the ability to create those scopes so they can easily get to that information through here very quickly. Now in your endpoints, they're running of course, the Avanti endpoint management agent. And that also gives them the ability to click right there on their dash dash uh, board or desktop, or, uh, you know, their system tray, and they can actually report problems with patches. So as you're rolling things out, um, if it starts to create error messages, if it starts to slow performance down, they can easily open up that little agent on their desktop, select from a drop down list of all the applications that you have in your inventory. So we know, you know everything that, that's out there based on our latest inventory. And they can select it and then report back that information so that you can open up a console here and see, you know, as you're rolling out patches, if there are any problems, in which case, that'd be an example where if you start getting uh, problems reported from end users, where well, you're probably gonna wanna go in and start grabbing that that, uh, that particular vulnerability or that particular patch and drop that into this do not scan folder so that we stop deploying it until we figure out what's going on with all of those reports, in which time then we can put it back in the rotation once we've dealt with it or effectively remediated whatever problems it's causing. Now, you can also deploy patches you know, on mass um, very easily just through what's called a scheduled task. You know, so I can take a downloaded patch that is Microsoft security patch, for example. And I can just grab that patch and drag that down here onto this scheduled task tab. And I'll see it kind of flips over to this scheduled task. And I can come in here and I can drop this task into a list that you see, you know, like you see here, I've got a whole list of you know, different folders of tasks, everything from patches to, you know, other types of tasks. And I can drop this task in here so that I can start deploying it to some group of machines. I can do the same thing that I do with the drag and drop just by right clicking and saying I want to, you know, create, well, let me grab a, uh, let me grab one that's actually available for scheduling. And we'll go in and we'll you know, say, I want to schedule this patch to deploy to some group of machines you know, later this afternoon or again this weekend. Well, let's pull up that list. On the scheduled task tab, you can also kick off you know, that particular patch or deployment to a specific group of machines. So if I've got, let's see where my patch land or grab it. 
let's see if we can get one. Let's take, here we go. So there's a 20 update. So I've got a patch. You know, I've gone and downloaded it, grabbed it, dropped it into the task portal. Now, when it comes time to how I want to, you know, where I want to deploy that patch or who I want to deploy that patch to, you know, I can easily go up and say all devices, right? Just come up here and do a control A and grab everybody and everything. Or I could also use those scopes. So again, I might want to say I want to deploy this patch to all my desktop machines. So I grab my desktops and I drag those onto that update and you'll see those desktops, 71 desktops dropping down. Maybe I want to add my laptops too because I want to you know, grab all my client devices. So I grab the laptops and we'll throw them down on that update. So now I've got all my desktops and all my laptops scheduled to receive that patch on whatever my typical patch you know, time or schedule is or window is, or if it's something that I want to manually kick off, you know, I can go in now and say, you know, let's immediately start patching all these machines right now, in which case they'll all flip into that active column. And then you'll be able to track you know, individual updates as the agents report back, you know, the success or failure of, you know, that patch being installed on that endpoint. So again, you can go through and have things set up to where those patches are downloading and being deployed automatically based on criteria. You know, want to make sure all the critical security patches are always installed on all my desktops and laptops. Um, or you could come in and do things very manually where you could simply go through and browse all of that downloaded patch content and simply take those patches and, you know, drag those patches into that scheduled task tab, you know, drag some machines onto that task and start deploying it into you know, large groups of users in that way. Now, if you're looking to do something a little more elaborate, um, where perhaps you wanna, you know, download all the patch content initially, but before you start deploying it, you wanna do some testing, maybe in a limited scale and then kind of rolling things out, you can create what's called a rollout project. The rollout project allows you to define, number one, what actions you wanna perform during that particular you know, phase of the project. And of course, when we're talking about a, a patch project, we're talking about you know, which patches are we talking about deploying? So again, I can go through and I can you know, add all of those patches that we've downloaded and I can add them into this pilot group phase and say, okay, this is my phase one. You know, I want to make sure and test out all these patches on some pilot group. Right? In which case, I'm going to assign this this uh, phase one to some you know select group of machines. And I don't want to do it to everybody, but I only want to do it to some devices. So this is where I go in and define maybe one of those scopes. Maybe I can create a scope called test lab or test machines. That way I can say, I wanna download these patches and I just wanna deploy it to these 12 machines that I have set up over here in my lab. And in there I can define uh, an exit gate or an exit criteria. So my exit criteria may be that I wanna make sure I have a 90% success rate on installing those patches. If I get a 90% success rate at phase one, it automatically then moves to the next phase, which may be that you're grabbing a larger set of patches and or testing some additional patches. Um, it may be that you're expanding the size of that test group from maybe 25 to 100 machines or 250 so that you know, as you achieve success in one stage, then you can move to that next stage, slowly rolling all the way up to you know, that last ultimate stage, which you can see is that global auto fix, meaning deploy this to anybody and everybody that needs it across the board. Because we've already been through several phases of tests and reviews and reports of you know, problems and fixing those problems. So that by the time you, know, you 
you meet that exit criteria, you know, for your production group, which may be more like, you know, 98, 99% success rate. So if 99% of the machines in phase five complete successfully, then roll it out to everybody in the organization um, so that you can have this set up. So that as those new patches are coming out, you're doing that download once a week or once a month, those patches can automatically be selected and loaded into this, this rollout project. So every month or every week, whatever that schedule is, they can go through this kind of test process. But once they're put into the funnel, so to speak, on the top end, they'll proceed as long as you're having success. Now, if things are, if the patches are failing, right? It's causing machines to crash everywhere. Then it's never going to move past that test group because you're not going to hit your 80 or 90%, whatever you said is that exit gate. Um, but typically, you know, if everything goes well um, and you have this set up and working well for you, um, that is you know, something that you can have. And let's see, here we go. So here's your exit criteria. So, you know, I can go in and define what my criteria are, um, how long I want to, you know, hold that criteria. Meaning how long before, you know, if I don't get 80% in two or three months, let's just scrap it and start over. Um, but that way you can set up a very automated patch process is that some customers that have good rollout projects, really, this is a, a one and done type of, of scenario where you get the project set up in the right phases um, so that you're catching any problems that are coming out as new patches are getting released. But again, as long as everything installs smoothly and doesn't cause uh, any issues, then those patches can naturally get rolled out across the organization, you know, through those phases as you'd like to. Whether it's, you know, six phases or 12 phases and you do things by department or by region or, or by operating system, um, you know, you can break up those projects however you deem fit. But that's a nice way to put some automation on it. And then, of course, all of the, the rollout of, you know, the patches and the installation of the patches of the endpoints is going to, of course, be reflected in the inventory that you then take tomorrow or next week or when that next scheduled inventory is uh, scheduled to run. Or you can also go and, of course, pull reports. Um, a tool like Extraction, um, which is their online you know, SaaS-based analytic uh, BI tool. So you can build on kind of on-the-fly dashboards and reports. That way all of the, the patch actions and the execution of those patches and of course the results of the inventory can be something that you can have displayed. Stop this free cycle here. You can have displayed on an overhead, you know, or on, on an executive's dashboard so they can give them that you know, overall view of the patch perspective um, while still giving you the ability to drill down. So if they're only concerned about thing, you know, critical patches, I can drill down into just those critical patches. If I'm just interested in a particular operating system, you know, I can filter on that. Um, that way you can drill down, not just through the console here, um, but all, all the way to the records. So if you want to actually see the machines or see the patches in this case that are missing and being able to pull up all that content and all the detail so you can export it um, you can schedule you know this content to be delivered via email um, whether it's the raw data or whether you want somebody to have the you know the raw graphics um, and that way you can use this to pull in you know all your key metrics about not just patching but it could be anything you know, cyber related, and especially in getting into government, you know, uh, patches are not your only thing to deal with. So a tool like extraction is a way to not only be able to take all of the patch information we've talked about and display it, but maybe events on the network that are occurring, occurring antivirus, spyware threats that may be coming in, um, you name it. 
Now with that, I'll open it up for any questions and or comments. So Rich, if you've got anything we coming in so far. Questions. We do have questions, Kyle. So let's start with the first one. Is there a chance a failure test patch slips through another phase? And let me open this. Uh, I.e. from phase one to phase two ever. Um, not if your exit gate, not if your exit criteria are set up. Now, obviously, if because those would be set up on a whole group of patches. So when you set up that rollout project and you define what that what that pilot group of patches are, um, then I'm going in and I'm saying I need 80 percent success rate for every one of these patches. In other words, each patch needs to, if I've yet say I'm installing on 100 machines, every one of these patches needs to install successfully on at least 80 out of those 100 boxes to move forward. If one of them only installs successfully on 75 of those 100, it gets left behind. The other patches continue forward. So the, the patches that don't meet the exit criteria, they, they stay in phase one, but you can and that is something, that's an option you can choose, right? Whether you want everything to be treated as a group. If one patch fails, fail the whole phase, right? Stop it there. Or if just one patch fails, do I just want to fail that patch and allow the rest of that the patches in that phase to continue on? I hope that answered that. And while we're waiting to see if that answered or not, there's another question. What are the control measures for each phase? Can I define or customize criteria for each phase based on what my organization's needs are? Um, you can define it for each phase. However, the, the criteria that you have to set in terms of what is that exit gate, um, those things are limited, right? It's really based on time. Um, how much time has expired? You know, don't you know if it's been so many days, move it to the next phase. Um, but also that success rate, right? So that if I want to make sure that things are successful, I can come in and you know choose what my again. This is where I would have that scope. You know, we call the you know lab environment or test environment, right? I'm going to say my my target is this lab. Um, and I want to verify that everything's working by either checking to see that the vulnerability is detected, or I want to see that the vulnerability is not detected, and I want to see that the patch is installed. Here's where I put my minimum percentage. So, of course, if you really want to ramp up, if you want to eliminate all errors, I mean, it's, you want to do right there, 100% across the board. And, and if it doesn't meet that, then stop right there. You know, so that you can, of course, at night, if you're, if you're doing 100%, you know, at phase one, um, there's really not going to be a, a whole lot of need for phase two, three, four, five, and six. You're probably going to go right from phase one to phase six. Okay, another question. Uh, what tools are available for cutting down some of the clutter reporting? Cutting in some of the clutter. Man, I guess I'd have, I'd have a follow up there in terms of what you mean by like clutter reporting, like like just the mass of of the updates and patches to deal with when it comes to reporting. Or I'm not sure I understand the question on that one, Rich. The response from Adam was yes. Okay, so so dealing with all of this. I guess I don't, know, I don't know if that's the reporting he's talking about, but that's really with the with the folders. I mean, because typically what you want, and this is part of what you set up in the download, right? Is when I when I set up the initial download of all this content, where do I want that content to go by default? So if you want to be really cautious, right? I can say go down all this stuff, but throw it all in the do not scan folder, meaning don't. I'm not going to scan for anything that I download unless I go look at it and I'm going to manually throw it into that scan folder one by one or one group at a time, you know, multi-select. But that's where you can choose when you download that content from Shavlik, 
you know, where do I want all of that content to end up in terms of these folders so that you can kind of decide, do I want to have a, um, you know, throw it on the scan folder, in which case it's deploy it unless told otherwise, or have it all download into that do not scan folder, which is the opposite, you know, don't do anything unless told otherwise. And then you're moving things, you know, in and out of those folders as you get reports of bad apps or um, as you determine that there's uh, a problem with a particular patch, you're just moving those this content around or in some cases, um, even going in and, and hiding it. You know, you can just go in and hide a particular patch so that um, it just doesn't show up anymore, um, which can be done on an individual basis or also um, you can create a query, just like you could create a query for you know devices, for example. Um, you can create queries for all types of purposes. You, know, you can see, even see here, I've got queries you can create automatically from from vulnerabilities, right? So if you download a vulnerability, you can create a quick query that looks for that condition, and it'll tell you all the machines in your inventory that suffer from that particular vulnerability. And of course, all these have been long ago patched, of course. Um, but that way you can use use those as a way to determine you know, what needs to be you know, filtered out. So you can create a query that filters out Firefox and Java and 7-Zip and all the other unnecessary files um, that you might not want. So that ultimately, because you'll see, this is why I frequently, I hate to click on this scan folder a lot because if you go in and download a lot of content, it can take you, you know, sometimes 10, 15 minutes for this screen to pop up just because there's, you know, several hundred thousand patches. Um, so I always recommend, you know, the easiest way to manage and clean up reports is to clean up what your, clean up your download content first. You know, remove any unnecessary languages if you got those things selected. If you've got drivers and things in here for, of course, you know, uh, models you don't care about, certainly remove those. Um, but then also being able to go in and create you know, a query that you can attach to this. So again, I can have some some filters on there above and beyond because most people stop right here with this checkbox form and that you're going to get a ton of content that's going to be not applicable to you, even though you think you've selected everything pretty closely because there's still going to be a lot of apps and things that you're going to get that you don't care about. That's where you can come in here and build some filters to say, you know, I don't care about, Office 2016, maybe you only have Office 2019. So don't give me Office 2016, don't, don't give me 2010, don't give me Adobe 9 products. So that you're gonna scale back that download, you're gonna have much more responsive system and your reports are gonna be much more accurate because it's most of the time what's junking up the reports is a bunch of applications and a bunch of patches that have zeros and, and or ones next to them that aren't really critical. Um, as opposed to those things that affect, you know, your entire estate. And we did have another question, but they just just told me that you inadvertently answered theirs too. So, so uh, a twofer. A twofer. I always yeah. love a twofer. Those That's good. Great. Uh, folks, we do have we we have like three minutes left. So if there are any other last minute questions, now's the time to ask. Great participation. Uh, uh, a lot of you have reached me out reached out to me during the, the uh, presentation today. Uh, uh, it's it's pretty impressive. So I want to thank all of you for taking time out to join us. So any last minute questions? Now's the time to ask. Uh, any uh, last minute comments uh, on your behalf, Kyle? Are you done? Oh wait a minute. They asked, how is this product licensed? Oh, that's a good question. This product is licensed based on the number of uh, desktop uh, management agents. Um, so when I say agent, that's not a person, but you know, an actual piece of software on that endpoint. So we've got agents for Unix, Linux, Windows, and Mac OSs. Of course, that covers physical and virtual. So it's really about how many, not how many you discover, 
right? Because you're gonna you might discover a bunch of switches and routers. You may discover five thousand devices. Um, but in terms of uh, licensing, how many devices are you going to want to have the ability to patch? Servers, laptops, desktops. Uh, count those up, and they'll be able to give you a quote. You know, based on the number of licenses. Okay, folks, if there's anyone else, uh, oh, wait a minute, here's another question slide in. What are the supported OSs? Mm. Anyway, so we got Windows, Linux, Unix, and Macs. And there are some, we can um, also provide a breakdown, I never had it off the top of my head, of the different flavors you know, of Linux from Red Hat Enterprise to Debian to CentOS, you know, and the different variants of Unix. Um, but there, there's agents for all four. Um, no difference in license, you know, an agent for Unix is the same cost, same license as an agent for Windows. Um, so again, it's really just the number of devices to be managed. Um, and then the agents themselves, right, are going to be built in, you know, to the console that you're going to deploy. So you're going to have a Unix agent that you're going to put on your Unix boxes, a Linux agent to put on your Linux boxes. And you may even have different flavors of these, right? So you may have go in and configure a couple of different kinds of Linux agents. One of them with, uh, example, be remote control settings, right? I might want to have certain Linux boxes where remote control requires authorization, but then I would have some Linux servers. Nobody's going to be sitting there. I don't want to have to wait for somebody to click OK. I just want to be able to remote control those. So that's where you can take those agents and configure them according to your needs and build a library of those so that you may have server agents, desktop agents, et cetera. And Mr. Lunsford, we'll make sure we get that information over to you. So thank you for that question. Uh, another question is how about application patching like Adobe? Uh, good question. Um, same exact process, which is a great part. Um, a lot of products you have to patch Adobe products and stuff like that separately, but with with uh, Avanti, um, Adobe, you know that that's part of that download, right? So you see, I'm getting Shockwave patches and Flash patches and Adobe Reader patches and everything, and I can do the same thing with these. I can tell it, you know, go in here and tell it to auto fix these and deploy it to everybody. I can drop it into that scan folder, or do not scan folder. Um, and that goes not just for Adobe, but every vendor you see in this list, I, I mentioned before, 7-Zip to Yahoo Messenger, but this kind of fills in, you know, everything in between those two that I mentioned, from Flash to Google to Chrome. Um, so a large list of third-party apps. So these can all be patched in the same way you patch your operating system. If you use WSS today, um, you know, for your OS, this will allow you to do the exact same thing, but patch your Zoom clients just like you can, you know, Windows 10, for example. Okay, and uh, you're welcome, Mr. Gupta and, and Sherry G. Uh, thank you so much for the comments. Audience, I, I want to thank you guys for the interaction today. It's great to hear all these shout outs or, or read all the shout outs from Toronto and Napa, San Francisco, Chicago, New York. I mean, you guys are just popping up all over the place. So thank you, you made it interesting. Thank you for your, your interaction and asking questions. And uh, any last minute questions before we before we wrap up? And a lot of the requests that a lot of you have made in your question and your in your chats, um, and you got Atlanta, you had to sneak that in, Mr. Martin, gotcha in Atlanta. Uh, we'll make sure we get that information out to you uh, in the next couple of days. We'll make sure that we get everything that you've requested. I've, I've taken note of all the requests that you guys have made in the audience. So we'll make sure we get all the information you're looking for and uh, and help you along. Uh, Kyle, I, I think that's it. Any, anything last minute you want to share? Uh, no, just thank you everybody for your time and uh, wish everybody a great evening and be safe. Uh, Kyle, thank you for taking time out of you. Oh, wait a minute. We have one more. Uh, Mr. Leftridge has the last question. What about clients who require VPN access to get the patches? Uh, great question. And you just caught me right before I shut that down, didn't you? So um, there is a component that you can stand up in your data center called a cloud service appliance. Um, think of this as your patching proxy server, right? So this would enable you to 
patch users at home on their couch or in an airport terminal or hotel lobby, as long as they have the the employment agent on their desktop or laptop, probably not carrying a desktop, but on that laptop, um, and they have an internet connection, then they'll be able to communicate and get their patches through this cloud appliance. Okay, great stuff. And and Bob, I'm glad you brought that up, Bob. Uh, those of you, anybody who attended this today, you will be receiving a gift card directly from Domino's within the next five business days following this event. So uh, don't don't fret. You'll get a gift card from Domino's. It's pretty efficient. So they'll get that out to you in five days uh, following uh, the end of this event. And those of you that made recording requests, I've made notes of that. And uh, we'll make sure we get copies of the recording out when the recording is available. The recording won't be available till next Thursday. and uh, But we'll get make sure we get that out to you. If it does come in earlier, we'll do that do that as well uh one last uh one last request here kyle before we wrap up it looks like we've got a, a, another good one will this also work for new machines after imaging absolutely well and and one of the one of the other components of the solution that we didn't get into is os imaging and ultimately you know as a best practice um you would use you, you build your os image to contain your your uh, endpoint agent and that only, right? So the minute the operating system boots up, it's gonna contact the server. It's, you know, it's got the operating system. Now it's gonna start grabbing whatever patches are assigned to it, whatever applications it's supposed to have. So you're, the design is you can literally boot up a machine, you know, plug it onto the network, turn it on, have the OS laid down, has that agent on it, and then the agent's going to start grabbing the patches and the app, so it'll provision the whole stack for you. And Mr. Lethbridge, I see now I'm going to have a plethora of questions after this answer. We are happy to get those answers to you. If you would like to go ahead and email me at rich.longo at flycastpartners.com, uh, Mr. Lethbridge will get you all the answers that you require and, and make sure we get the right information for you. And uh, and especially about the imaging, go ahead and email me and I'll make sure that we get you the information you're looking for. Uh, we'll get somebody to reach out to you on that. So uh, by all means. OK, you're welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, folks. Appreciate all the questions. Should you have any other additional questions? It's not over. You can still email me. You can email me at rich.longo uh, flycastpartners.com. You can also go ahead and, and send us an email info at, at uh, flycastpartners.com or pick up that phone. Call us at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2278. I have to say this has been one of the most incredible uh, audiences that have been very participatory. It's been really, really neat. I want to thank every one of you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to join us. Kyle, thank you for taking time out of your day to show us how all this works and how it can benefit these organizations. You are very welcome. All right, folks, until our next uh, event, I want all of you to stay safe out there. See you.